am incredibly passionate about our business, and not just because I'm the CEO of the company. My passion began when I was six years old, the first time I put on skis and ski boots at a small ski area in Wisconsin. I grew up in downtown Chicago, surrounded by skyscrapers. My love of skiing started at that small ski area in Wisconsin and led to many childhood ski trips to Colorado, adult ski trips to Colorado, and eventually my dream to live there. But I didn't realize that dream immediately. After college, I worked for Ford Motor Company, went to grad school, worked at Kraft Foods, and PepsiCo. Finally, in 2011, I decided to realize my dream. I quit my job at PepsiCo and moved to Colorado. I've now been with Vail Resorts for over 11 years. The first 10 years of my time with the company, I was chief marketing officer. I was responsible for building our Epic Pass business and building our capabilities in data analytics and data science. And last year, I had the honor, actually last year, this week last year, I had the honor of being appointed CEO of this company. As I mentioned at the beginning, I am incredibly passionate about this business. I'm passionate about what we've built, the growth potential, and our culture. And I'm going to talk about each of those with you today. So let's start with what we've built. Vail Resorts is the largest mountain operator, mountain resort operator in the world. We have 41 world-class owned and operated resorts across the US, Canada, Australia, and now Europe. We have a very deliberate approach to building a network. And that word network is critical. That network is about connecting local ski areas, just like that one in Wisconsin that I started skiing at, to major metropolitan markets like Chicago, New York, Boston. It's also about leading regional, regional ski resorts, excuse me, like Stowe, Mount Snow, Hunter, Okemo. And then ultimately, it's about the world-class destinations. You might notice when you look at this map that we own three ski resorts in Australia. And you might be wondering why. It is the same strategy of creating a network. There are a lot of skiers in Australia. And by owning two resorts outside of Melbourne and one resort outside of Sydney, we can connect to those local, the local skiing and connect them on a pass to their destination trips when they come to North America. Vail, Beaver Creek, Breckenridge, Park City, Whistler Blackcomb, and Keystone. These are some of the most popular ski resorts in North America. And as you can see, some of the most well-known and highest awareness ski resorts in North America. They are a key asset and a key differentiator for our company. And that differentiation is in the context of an industry where there is no new supply. No new supply. There have been no new ski resorts created of scale since the early 1980s. This is not the same as a hotel business or other travel and leisure business. These assets are irreplaceable. You cannot build another Vail Mountain across the street from Vail Mountain. And you cannot build another Vail Mountain right next door to Vail Mountain. This is a critical part of our business model. Also, I want to talk about two aspects of our network, owned and operated and vertical integration. We own and operate our resorts. This is very important to us. This enables us to integrate our systems, collect data, invest in the guest experience. It also enables us to execute product and pricing strategies across the entire portfolio and leverage operational best practices across our portfolio. Yes, we have a few partners that are strategic and important to us, but that is not our strategy for growth. 
Our business is also vertically integrated. That means we can touch almost every aspect of the guest experience. When you arrive in Colorado for a, a destination vacation at one of our resorts, we touch your transportation, your lodging, your rental equipment, your restaurants, ski school, retail stores. So when we combine an owned and operated network and a vertically integrated business, that enables a significant competitive advantage for our company, data. We have a lot of data. We know when you skied, where you skied, how often you skied. And as you can see here, over half of all destination guests are in our database in North America, and that continues to grow. I spent the first 10 years of my time with Vail Resorts building out our data analytics and our data science capabilities. How do we use the data? We use data to understand our guest behavior, predict our guest behavior, and influence our guest behavior. We've used that data un to unlock growth on our season pass business and lift revenue. We use it to enable product and pricing decisions based on behavior and price elasticity data. We can talk to our guests one-to-one -one and draw them into an experience that's relevant to them. We can link our guest experience on mountain net promoter scores back into the database and guest behavior and use that information to prioritize how we invest in the guest experience on mountain. That data and those insights have been instrumental in our growth to date. And we have so much more we can do. We are barely scratching the surface. Our guest, we have an incredibly passionate guest. Affluent, passionate, loyal, active, young. If you were to talk to our guests, they would not say, I go skiing, I go snowboarding. They would say, I am a skier, I am a snowboarder. And that passion and that sense of identity creates loyalty and resilience for our company. So we connect our resort network to our guests with Epic Pass. Epic Pass has transformed the ski industry. It used to be that a pass was for one resort and locals and was extremely expensive. In 2008, we launched Epic Pass and we changed all of that. We made a pass for multiple resorts, attracted destination guests into a pass and, and delivered that at value, at a value. That value that we give to our guests, very important though, that it's in exchange for something very important to our company, and that's advanced commitment. When our guests buy a pass, they are committing to our network of resorts in a non-refundable product before the season ever starts. Why is that valuable to us? because it creates stability, stability. Stability in the face of weather variability, climate changes, and stability in the face of economic uncertainty. It also creates loyalty and lifetime value by subscribing our guests to our network of resorts. Another important characteristic of our business is high flow through given the fixed cost dynamics of our business. The cost of opening Vail Mountain on a Tuesday is the same as opening Vail Mountain on a busy day like Christmas. The fixed cost nature of our business means that incremental growth generates meaningful margin and free cash flow. We take a very disciplined approach to capital allocation. We prioritize high return investments back on the mountain into the guest experience, investments in our employees, investments in acquisitions and expansion, and return of capital back to our shareholders in the form of a dividend and share repurchases. So with that foundation of what we have built, what is the growth potential? I'm gonna talk about four areas of focus for our growth potential today. 
the subscription model, data-driven everything, expansion, and inclusion. The subscription model. We are transforming our business into a subscription with Epic Pass. We know, and I already shared, that moving someone into a pass creates enormous stability for our company. But we know that when someone moves into a pass, they have higher guest satisfaction, higher return rate, higher frequency, higher spend, and they spread their visits across the season utilizing excess capacity. Our vision is to achieve 75% plus of our lift revenue committed in advance in a subscription model. And as you can see, go back a slide. Our vision is to achieve 75% plus of our lift revenue committed in advance in the subscription model. And as you can see, we're making incredible progress toward that vision. Second area of growth opportunity, data-driven everything. As I shared, we have a lot of data. We know a lot about our guest behavior, where you skied, when you skied, how often you skied, your experience on the mountain, data about our operations, data about our ancillary businesses. And yes, we've used that data to unlock growth in pass and lift revenue. We have used that data to prioritize and focus what our investments in the guest experience are on the mountain. But there's so much more that we can do. I'll give you three examples. The first is using data to unlock our ancillary business growth, like ski school or rental gear. If we know information about you, what runs you skied, what level of a skier you are, how can we use that data to draw you into a ski school experience that's relevant to you? A big opportunity for us for growth. The second area is operational efficiency. I'm incredibly passionate about operational efficiency. We have data, I'll give you an example. We have data about our chairlifts. We know how fast the chairlifts move. We know how many people we can fit on a chairlift. We know how many people are standing in line. And we know what the lift line wait times are. So utilizing all of that data, we can optimize the design of the lift maze. We can optimize how we load the chairlifts. And why does that matter? Because it reduces the lift line wait times which improves the guest experience. A third area of opportunity for us on data is talent. Using the data in how we hire, how we retain, how we develop the best talent, how we use the data to optimize labor utilization across our resorts. A third area of opportunity, expansion. As I mentioned before, we have a presence in US, Canada, Australia, and now Europe. And there's still more opportunity for expansion. In North America, there are premium assets that we would love to have in our portfolio. There are local and regional resorts that will be accretive to our portfolio. Europe. The total addressable market in Europe of skiers is three times the size of North America. Huge opportunity for growth. And I am incredibly excited that we have our first acquisition in Europe with Andermont in Switzerland. And I look forward to us building our reputation there, learning and listening so that we can unlock future potential for expansion and growth in Europe. The third opportunity on expansion, Asia. We would like to have a presence in Japan in the future. Why? 
because Japan opens up the network opportunity from Australia. All of those skiers that are skiing at our resorts in Australia that take destination trips to ski in North America, but they also go to Japan to ski. The other benefit to Japan is the emerging popularity of snow sports in China and Asia. And being in Japan will well position us in the future to take advantage of that. And lastly, inclusion. The future of this sport is inclusion. This is not a diverse sport or industry. This industry has been predominantly male and white. And the industry is not fast growing because the fastest segments of our population are not actually participating in the sport. Now, we've made a lot of progress as a company with gender. Almost half of our corporate leaders are women. Our board of directors is 50% women. But racial diversity is an imperative for the company and the industry for growth. And progress on that starts with us as a company. I've had people say to me, well, don't you think, Kirsten, you could improve the diversity of this sport if you just did a better job of marketing to diverse guests? It's not that simple. We have to start with ourselves first as a company and create a culture that is welcoming, inclusive, and diverse so we can hire diverse employees that ultimately then can lead to us creating a welcoming environment at our resorts for diverse guests. So I've shared with you some of the key areas for growth. And now I want to talk about the foundation of all of that, and that is our culture. We have a very unique culture, and it is grounded in our mission. Our mission is to create an experience of a lifetime. We don't make anything. We create an experience. And that mission to create an experience of a lifetime is incredibly powerful and motivating in our company. In fact, if I said to all of you, stop any one of our employees at any one of our resorts and in the corporate office and ask them, what is the mission of this company? Every single one of them will tell you it is to create an experience of a lifetime. And not because I require them to memorize it. <laughs> Actually, because it has meaning to them. They are passionate about it. We have over 50,000 employees who've merged who they are with what they do. And that kind of passion creates a very unique and powerful culture. The second part of our culture is a focus on leadership. We believe that leadership is the unlock to superior financial performance and innovation. And we focus on five key aspects of leadership. The first, self-awareness. You can't lead others if you don't know yourself first. Who are you? What do you stand for? What are you good at? What are you not good at? Being comfortable in your own skin. Second is vulnerability. People do not want perfect leaders. They want leaders that make mistakes, acknowledge when they make mistakes, and learn from them. Third is candor. And I don't mean candor in saying whatever you want, but candor in terms of being in service of the person you're giving feedback to and being in service of the company. Fourth is agility. The world around us is changing so fast. Our guests are changing. We need leaders that can constantly grow and adapt and evolve in order to navigate that. And the fifth area of leadership is sitting with tension. And no, I don't mean sitting in a room where there's tension between you and another person. What I mean is sitting with the tension of holding seemingly opposing concepts and having to navigate that and make decisions. 
sitting with the tension of not being able to make everyone happy and being able to navigate that as a leader. And the last part about our culture is our commitment to sustainability. Our product is the outdoors. Our employees take being stewards of the outdoors very seriously. And we as a company have made a bold commitment, a commitment to zero net operating footprint by 2030. That includes zero net emissions, zero waste to landfill, and zero net operating impact on forest and habitat. So I've shared with you what we've built, the growth potential, and our culture. Well, what am I focused on most immediately this upcoming season? And yes, our first resort opened, Keystone. So people are skiing already. Last season was very challenging. Our business was impacted during our busiest time period during Christmas with low snow, the escalation of a new variant of COVID called Omicron, and the global labor shortage. So as we head into next season, I'm very focused on the investments that we are making to ensure that our guests have a great experience. There's three different investments. The first is an investment in our people. We announced a $175 million investment in our employees, including higher wages, benefits, leadership development, affordable housing. Second is investing in the on-mountain experience. We have a capital plan this year of over $300 million going back into the on-mountain experience, including 18 new chairlifts at 12 different resorts. Why do chairlifts matter? Because they improve the guest experience of waiting in line for the lift. And the third area of investment is technology. I'm incredibly excited about this. We just announced Mobile Pass and Mobile Lift Ticket. We'll be piloting it this season for a rollout the following season. And what you'll be able to do is load your pass or your lift ticket onto your phone, and most importantly, put it in your ski jacket and not take it out again. That we will use low energy Bluetooth technology to scan you. Why does that improve the guest experience? Because it reduces another pain point in the experience, waiting in the window ticket line. Nobody likes waiting in lines. I'll end with a few thoughts about something that's on everyone's mind, the economy. So what does all of this mean for Vail Resorts in the face of economic uncertainty? We have an incredibly strong and resilient business model because of advanced commitment, because we attract a high-end guest, because we have no new supply in our industry. During the global financial crisis in 2008-2009, our skier visits to our resorts were down 5% and our EBITDA was down 26%. And now when I look at where our business is today, we are in a much stronger position than we were at that time. At that time, we only had five ski resorts in our portfolio that were destination ski resorts. Now we have 41 ski resorts, including so many different geographies and options for our guests to ski locally, to ski regionally, and yes, to also go to our destination resorts. Back then, only 26% of our lift revenue was committed in advance of the season. Today, over 60% of our lift revenue is committed in advance of the season. And our pass is arguably one of the best values in skiing. We are in a strong position to navigate the uncertainties of the economy. So in closing, 
I am passionate about what we've built, the growth potential, and our culture. To achieve growth, we are reimagining. We are reimagining our company, we're reimagining the industry, and we're reimagining the guest experience. Whenever you reimagine, it will not always be easy. It will not always go smoothly. Last year, Melody Hobson from Ariel Investments said to me, world class is not for the faint of heart. And those words of wisdom really resonated with me because we, Vail Resorts, are not of the faint of heart. Thank you. Thank you. We have time, we have time questions? Question. I can't see. 15 minutes, David. Oh, 15 minutes. Two. Uh, yes, that was a wonderful presentation. Oh, sorry. Thank oh, you. That was a very wonderful presentation. Um, but you really didn't address climate change too much and the effect it has in, on your company. And I noticed every picture had snow in it. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any plans to include warmer weather activities, perhaps? <laughs> well, a couple of things that we're doing there. One is we have diversified our geographies substantially in order to mitigate the impact of that. The second is we're very focused on advanced commitment and, as I shared, committing a significant portion of our revenue before the season starts. The third thing is our commitment to sustainability and the work that we're doing to have an impact on our net operating footprint, and that is to have zero net operating footprint by 2030, including zero net emissions, zero waste to landfill, and zero impact on habitat and forests. All of those are critical initiatives that we're focused on. We also invest in high efficiency snowmaking to help mitigate the, if there is a delay in snow, and uh, the geographic diversity, for example, having three resorts in Australia and their winter season just finished. And they had an incredible season, by the way. Thank you. Three. I think they heard you, Dave. Three. Hi. Um, Hi. I was wondering, you said you have 50,000 employees, and I'm guessing you must have a surge for the winter season. So how do you manage getting the same people back who are trained and dedicated to your mission? And uh, what do those people do in the off season? Do you have employment for them? Or um, you know, how does that work to get them back? Yeah, thank you for the question. So we have, we have employees that come for the winter and we work to retain them to come back to the following winter. We have employees that go from winter to summer and then we work to retain them from summer into the following winter. And then we have new applicants all the time. And in terms of what people do in the off season, it varies dramatically. You know, we have ski patrollers that work for us during the winter and in the off season, they're uh, emergency EMTs, they're firefighters. And we try to stay in touch with all of our employees so that we can have a strong retention rate Obviously, the investment that I talked about on stage today, $175 million in our employees in wages, benefits, leadership development, as well as affordable housing, is, makes that a critical priority for us. I talk about our employees a lot, but we do not make anything. We create an experience, and that experience is actually delivered by our people. They do not work for Vail Resorts. They are Vail Resorts. We'll go up on top seven. seven. 
Good morning. Um, I'd like to address you first as a skier, second as a shareholder. <laughs> How do you explain the vast overcrowding in the Northeast ski areas and the unsafe conditions that exist in the Northeast ski areas? That's my first part of my question. Um, secondly, What are you going to do about it? <laughs> well, we, uh, the guest experience is, yeah, core to who we are. And we are constantly looking at what are the dynamics, the popularity of a resort, and what investments do we need to make in the experience. A couple of actions that we take are investments in our lifts and infrastructure to ensure that our guests can move up and onto the mountain quickly. Another action that we've taken is limiting lift ticket sales, saying that we are going to sell less lift tickets so that we can ensure that we protect that guest experience. And we're constantly learning and taking new information in and demonstrating that we're willing to invest. And so if the problem is not solved, or new problems arise, I think a core tenant here is agility and that we're constantly willing to address it and invest in the experience. Thanks for the question. Four, over here. Hi, thanks for having us here today. That was a great presentation. Uh, as a skier, most of my life, I recently purchased some Epic Passes. And in planning our trip, I found that even though we had the Epic Pass, we still had to deal with limited lift ticket sales and had to plan which days we would ski at which resort way in advance of any idea of the weather. How can we manage that? So I think it depends on what pass you own, but we are not limiting and restricting days on our mountains for our pass holders. We prioritize our pass holders and their experience first. And so I would love to connect with you and make sure that we can help and support whatever challenges you're running into, because we want to be able to welcome you to our resort so you have an amazing time. Thank you. Up on top eight. Thank you. Uh, as a former skier and a present investor, I want to go back to the first person who asked the question by telling you one of my experiences. After I stopped skiing on a summer trip, we did something called hella hiking, which took us to ski resorts in mountains and enabled us to hike on glaciers, through mountain peaks, areas that we would be unable to get to otherwise. Sounds like That fun. was a great summer experience. <laughs> there is a myriad of people here who are in my circumstance who can't take advantage of this because we're not skiers anymore. So I would like to see Vail pursue that much, much more actively. Well, thank you so much for that. I, first, I want to try that myself. That sounds amazing. <laughs> I want to try that experience, and thank you for the idea. We're always looking for new opportunities and new experiences to bring into our portfolio. Two over here. Hi. I just Hi. wanted to, I saw that you are um, in New York City. Where in New York City? W which resort? Oh, we have multiple resorts that you can access for residents of New York City. One of them in, uh, that you might recognize is Hunter Mountain. Four. So thanks for having us, Ron. Great to see you as always. Um, my question is actually a follow-on to the gentleman's comment about hella hiking. Yes. And you talked a lot about in-season and skiing, and we didn't talk about the value of ski resorts and the entities you own in the summer and how you're yes. maximizing that. And yeah. do you have growth plans for bringing concert tours or, you know, what are you doing to maximize revenue during the, the off season, which, you know, I love going to Colorado in the summer, so. 
It is beautiful in the summer, and we are really fortunate to have these incredible mountains, and they are incredibly popular, as you know, in the summer. So we do have visitation in the summer. We have at Whistler Black Home some of the best mountain biking in the world there. We have activities for families like zip lining and hiking trails and investments that we've made in summer to drive growth there. So yes, summer is a critical uh, opportunity for us, and we do have incredible activities uh, for our guests to enjoy in the summer months. Five in the back. Thank you. Uh, first of all, as a 30-year Army veteran, uh, I'd like to uh, tell Vale thank you very much for the discount on uh, the Epic Passes. Um, as far as I know, Vail gives the largest discount to military yes. people any, of any company in the United States. That is uh, true. And I want to say to you, thank you for your service to our country. It's been my honor. But what I would like to ask the question is, how many Epic Passes have you sold uh, for this season, and what's your full capacity? So, first of all, again, thank you for your service to our country and the reason why we are so committed to providing access and value to military personnel is because the founding of our company is actually from a veteran from the 10th Mountain Division, Pete Seibert. He's one of the founders of Vail Mountain and we are incredibly proud of that heritage and history that our company has. In terms of Epic Pass and what is our capacity, the, uh, well, I'm pleased to say that we had incredible growth of Epic Pass last year, and in our last September earnings, we grew that on top of the growth from last year. I want to make sure everyone is clear that pass sales growth is not the same as visitation growth. Pass sales are a product decision that people are making. Am I gonna buy a lift ticket or am I gonna buy a pass? And there's a trade-off that's made there. If I buy a lift ticket, it's refundable, it's also more expensive. I can get a great value by buying a pass, but that's a non-refundable commitment before the season ever starts. And so our past sales can grow dramatically higher than our visitation, and you saw that in our earnings report. Past sales were up dramatically. Our visitation is not up the same as past sales because people are making a product choice between a lift ticket and a pass versus a visit choice. And so, yes, we have strong growth on pass, and as a shareholder, if you're a shareholder, a shareholder, that is very valuable to you because that creates incredible stability for this company. Prior to passes being such a predominant part of the ski industry, this industry was feast or famine. There were good snow years, bad snow years, and that impacted companies' ability to reinvest in the experience. It impacted their employees and it impacted those communities. And by moving people out of a lift ticket into a pass and locking that revenue up before the season starts, we create an enormous amount of stability that even when we face challenges like snow or the economy, that you can count on our company to deliver strong results. Thank you. Three. Three. I right, one. one. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Uh, thanks so much for coming to speak today. As a woman, I really appreciate your voice. I mean, thank first you. of all, thank you for that. Thank also, you. as a skier and a mom of a mogul skier, I want to say thank you for your investment in the freestyle mogul course on Vail Mountain. Uh, it's definitely a world-class competition venue and a safe place for our kids to practice and compete. Uh, my question surrounds the leadership uh, qualities that you seek. Yes. And I'm particularly struck by uh, your emphasis on vulnerability, candor, and sitting with tension. How do you 
find leaders uh, who demonstrate these traits and how do you inspire those traits in your employees? Yeah, we, as part of our talent selection process, we are intensely focused on those leadership qualities. And not that every person we hire has all of those fully developed, but we're looking for potential. The potential and the eagerness to learn and grow and evolve as a leader and not be stuck. I also foster it. I'll give you, an, I'll give you a good example on the executive team. My executive team is 11 people. We meet every single week. And the first hour of our executive team meeting is feedback. Feedback for each other. This is quite unique. I've worked at some pretty amazing world-class companies like Ford Motor Company, Kraft, and PepsiCo, and I've actually never seen anything like this. But creating that space for feedback on the executive team, holding each other accountable, giving each other feedback as an individual in service of that person or in service of the company, creates a high-performing team where there's an enormous amount of trust and transparency in order for us to run this company. Thanks for the question. I think, I think we're out of time. Sorry. Um, but thank you so much for, uh, for doing this. Really appreciate thank it. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.